desire that is seen on the screen. I mean, this is a particular period where in America there were uh, male actors in drag who were, were, were very famous. Uh, there's a theater on Broadway that's still there that is named after one of those actors. But this, but what happens in this film is we actually see desire, which is so infrequent up until recent time. Would you, I'd like to ask Rob and, and the journalists this question. Edwin Carpenter, who talked about third sex or inner sex, it was that whole Oscar Wilde, Edwin Carpenter tradition that was handed down around this time. Do you know how uh, Hirschfeld felt about that? And because what we see on the screen in the, in the, in the type is that he was also talking about the in-between, the inner sex. I mean, we have other language today, but it's, it's so now. <coughs> this film is, uh, what happens on the screen is so con fucking contemporary. <laughs> it is. Well, um, I think, I think Herschel actually wrote a piece around the turn of the century called The Third Sex, so he might actually have been, please don't call me another, I think that's what I was <laughs> um, sort of reading, but, but, but it does seem uh, to be that's what he was getting at. And it, what, what also strikes me about sort of the sense that, you know, it, the, the lecture begins with like, you know, men in female that have female minds and female that have male minds and you begin sort of to cringe to be like, oh, this is some sort of like really weird and old fashioned way of thinking. And then he begins talking about sort of like, this is uh, a little bit more complex and he starts to differentiate gender from sexuality and that feels so uh, revelatory in you know, 1919 and the entire, the, the entire rhetoric of the film, the, the fact that it ends with this idea of like, uh, love needs to vanquish hatred. Right? It's just like love is love is love is love. Like that. Like we are having that conversation today, and you know, for so many people, it's so it's so now. But you know, we need to be reminded that like those conversations have been happening, and you know, it's they're not just in the past. But like, that there's a reason why they keep sort of com coming up. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I think the whole um, expression of gender variance was really very much part of the Hirschfeld Institute. Term transvestite? Yeah. Yeah, transvestite stuff was harsh. Uh, just a quick question. Thank you very much for being here tonight, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, um, of course, it's a miracle that we're able to have the footage that we have um, 40, 50 minutes of it approximately. Do we have any idea how long the film originally ran when it was first released? I asked UCLA, and they do not have a definitive figure at this point. Because it wasn't just like uh, the occasional scene, there were like gigantic sequences, uh, like uh, Paul and his family. Um. There's at least 20 minutes to mm -hmm. missing. Yeah. These so-called Aufklärungsfilme, these, these uh, social hygiene or didactic films, tended not to be especially long. So the, they, were, they were feature length, but feature length <coughs> time running about 70 minutes, exactly. So do we have any idea how many reels originally was, anything like that? Or, or I'll, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I knew someone would ask that, so I specifically asked UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Just a slight variation on the last question. Can you talk a bit about the reaction to the film when it was originally shown? Uh, reactions were mixed. There were some audiences that loved it and thought it was um, you know, progressive and really took to it, and then there were audiences who um, thought it was awful and corrupting the minds of children, and there were cat calls, and people walked out. By so 1920s, it was really banned. Old. Yes. So a year later, it was banned. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe if you want to test that back, we'll eventually have to come back with lots of hands. It's terrific. <laughs> um, would you address uh, 175? Uh, versus, for instance, the English law, which whether it's a political or not, you know, supposedly Queen Victoria said these things never happened between women, and therefore women were never mentioned in the law. And the point uh, I'm trying to bring up is that if 175 only addressed men, was it Hirschfeld's interest to broaden that uh, into a greater concept of sexuality rather than only having it be between men and homosexuals? Well, 175 was men and animals, so you could take your pick. 
Um, uh, and women were not persecuted under 175. There's one woman in, uh, in the film, paragraph 175, who talks about being lesbian, but her issue was being Jewish, and such why she had to get out of the country. behind you, and then we'll direct it behind you. Okay. Do we know anything about how Hirschfeld film was received and how a copy managed to survive in the Soviet Union? Sorry, could you repeat that, please? Do we, do we know anything about how the, I guess, Hirschfeld made a film that included portions of, of this film? And I'm just wondering how that film was received and how it survived in the Soviet Union. Well, let me just say this. There were some 40 copies made of different from the others uh, for release throughout Germany and, and, Amsterdam. and, and Amsterdam, to be exact. And those were all burned. How this ultimately ended up in Ukraine uh, is not clear. And this is not, again, it wasn't that, that there was, this was not a print of different from the others that wound up there, but rather Hirschfeld's film from 1927, Die Gesetze der Liebe, The Laws of Love, yeah, I, which I had folded in the 40 minutes of, of, of footage from different from Yes, so my question was, how was that film received? Oh, the, the, the Hirschfeld film of 27? Yes. Good question. <laughs> can, can we come back tomorrow? I know. <laughs> There's somebody waiting up in the front. Um, my, the mic's my, coming if you need it. Oh, oh here comes the mic. Uh, I'm recognizing this is just in a film festival for the GLBT community right now in New York and the metro area. Um, with the turmoil that's happening in the United States right now and the fact that we, um, it will not happen, but Trump has said he would overturn gay marriage and all these things like that. We could have the same kind of stuff happening with 50% of the population that um, live outside of New York and we could start seeing some of this stuff happening again. And I'm wondering how this film will be presented after a film festival so that young people in America can see this and see the history and move on and maybe react and say, we don't need this kind of hate in America. It's on YouTube now. One can see it on YouTube. Yeah. Well, not, not the not first, first not, not, not the like, polished one that we saw, but pretty much if you want it, just show it. Uh, sort of freely available, but. One of my students, uh, former students who I used to teach at Weston, Ilya Merritt, he now works at WYC. <coughs> He couldn't be here tonight. Some of you who listen to him on the radio right now, he's fundraising, I think, on other things. <laughs> but he asked when the next piece was shown. I hadn't had a chance to confer with you about this, Ashley. But I said, perhaps at MoMA or at Film Forum, so may show again in New York City. Whether it will actually travel, I don't know. I certainly hope so. I think Outfest usually, the Legacy Project has a history of making films available, and putting out DVDs, that sort of thing. So I don't know precisely what the plan is, but they have done it in the past, so I be surprised if they didn't do it for this film. I think it would also be faithful to the didactic nature of the film show. to show it in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was there, there where the mic go? You have the mic go? Good. Oh, perfect. <laughs> you like it ahead. <laughs> um, so I, I was also very much touched by how it begins in a very text-based um, setting where he's going through this history connecting himself to the ones who came before. Um, and I thought of when the I was doing cyanide um, pill scene care about. I thought of Turing. Um, and today, the announcement that, uh, the proposal at least, that the UK might um, pardon. propose the Turing law, uh, which would pardon all deceased people who were you know, punished or charged with gross indecency. Anyone still living um, with those charges could clear it. Um, so I was just thinking of that figure and wondering you know, what other contemporaries now or other contemporaries at the time were informative for the uh, either textual, interstitial um, translation process because that I, I found that of course the most interesting. But, like, how do you take German? Moment. I mean, today's news is an extraordinary moment for all of us. All those, all the shame is now rushed away. It's just extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> we. 
over in Berlin recently and shocked to realize that when the concentration camps were liberated, the homosexuals went from the concentration camps back to prison yep. because they were still criminals. Do, what, speak I'm sure yeah, you a little bit you. about that. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, the law remained on the books until 69, and men were arrested and incarcerated up until up until that time. And it, in fact, some men got to, tragic. were released from camps and were rearrested under paragraph 175. Several, two of whom are in the film. Oh. Are 